She always does a wonderful job, doesn't she? Let's give Holly a round of applause. We love you, Holly. Sorry. Hey, uh, let's take our Bibles this morning, please, and turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to stand together and read that in just a moment. But I was asked by a couple folks, uh, even as I came into the auditorium here this morning, if we would pray for some of the loved ones who are hurting. And some of you may know a, a young couple in town by the name of Chance and Jenny Collins. They live just across the street over here. Uh, they had a, a stillborn baby this past week, and we'd like to ask prayer for that. Also, um, Shelly Haycock asked if I would please pray for her dad, and she gave me a note here to read. It says, uh, pray for John Paul. He's battling an infection. Pray that his body would heal quickly, as he has been uh, through so much in recent days. If you can uh, think to send him a card, that would be great encouragement. Also, uh, her grandson, Shelly's grandson, Lucas, fractured his thumb this week and had to have stitches. If you're not aware, uh, Glenn Coates, his uh, son passed away. Jim, he was a, a, a twin of a brother named John who lives down in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. So let's pray for Glenn Coates during this uh, difficult time in his family. And Barb Marquardt, um, Julie Horton's mother, has been transferred over to the Mennonite home in Bluffton, uh, so we're thankful for that. Um, but keep praying for her as well. And also the folks down in Florida, and I'm going to ask Tim if he would uh, pray for these, and the folks in the Carolinas, and that storm went through actually Georgia and uh, Virginia and some other places got pounded with rain, and as you've probably seen the pictures, it just obliterated parts of the southeast. Let's stand together. We'll read from 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'll start with uh, verse 13. And notice if you have a translation like, like the one I'm using, there's what's called a rhetorical question at the end of verse 13. Does yours have a question mark? Do you know what a rhetorical question is? It's not designed to be answered. <laughs> it's designed to make a point. And I'm going to ask you this question before you leave today. I hope you'll answer it in your spirit and your heart. It says, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good. But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give a defense or an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For better it is, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. All right, Tim, would you come lead us in prayer, please? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I come to you first of all, Lord, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, uh, the ability that we have to have uh, your words before us. Lord, we know that many countries uh, have uh, not afforded the citizens there the freedoms that we have here in this country. So, Lord, I do thank you for, that we have that, uh, that gift of your word. Most of all, Lord, I thank you for that gift of salvation through the blood of Christ on the cross. Lord, I thank you for the, uh, the freedom that we have to meet here this morning. I thank you for Pastor that... that He'll be uh, breaking the word open to us this morning and uh, sharing what's on his heart. Lord, uh, once again, other countries have taken this freedom away. Lord, we do praise you that uh, Pastor, Pastor uh, Brunson was released from prison this week uh, for preaching the gospel over in the country of Turkey. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that his release has been, has been granted I thank you for his uh, strong testimony. Lord, would each of us have such a strong testimony out in the world? I pray, Lord, that you would uh, use each one of us here within the sound of my voice, Lord, to uh, dig into the scripture, to learn it, to know it, and to live it amongst those around us, Lord, that we may be a bright and shining light for the lost Lord, I thank you for the many blessings that you give to us each day. Lord, I thank you for the safety from the storms. 
Lord, I do lift up those who are hurting so much down south again from Hurricane Michael that's, that's come through and caused such devastation. Lord, I pray that through this time of difficulty and, and suffering and loss, Lord, that uh, each one would look up to you, Lord, for strength and for, for the, the gift that you afford to each one of us, again, through the shedding of the blood of Christ on the cross. Lord, there are ones in our midst this morning that are hurting and that are mourning the loss of loved ones. Lord, I think of the uh, Jim Coates family. I lift up to you, each one of them. I, I thank you for uh, the testimony of Glenn and Shirley and their family and, and uh, the testimony of Jim. Lord, I just pray that you would give comfort at this time as only you can. Lord, through this time, others would be drawn to the love of Christ. Lord, I think of the others that have been uh, sick and ailing in health. And um, Lord, I think of the, the good news that uh, you've given the rate of Boz this week, Jane and her, uh, her tests. I thank you for that. And I thank you that uh, John Paul is back home now and uh, pray that you would give him strength, give him healing and comfort him at this time. I think of Barb Markwood as well, <clears throat> who has uh, suffered uh, injury from this terrible crash and that, uh, Lord, that you're giving her healing and we thank you. Lord, I think of the, uh, the, the devastation that Chance and Jenny Collins must feel now from the loss of their, uh, their newborn baby. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just be with them at this time. I pray, Lord, that others would come alongside them and, and uh, be a comfort to them and show them love and, Lord, show them Christ. Lord, I think of uh, little Lucas who's uh, fractured his thumb and, and uh, gone through this injury. And, Lord, I pray that you would give him quick healing as well. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. We have so much to uh, give you praise for. Lord, I just pray that you would be with us this morning and uh, fill us with what you'd have us to, uh, again, to, to learn and to be able to take out and to, to give to those around us. Lord, I thank you that your grace is sufficient for us. So, Lord, now I pray that you be with uh, each aspect of the, the services today. I pray that you would be honored and glorified through each one. Lord, I pray that, uh, again, you'd be with Pastor as he brings your word to us this morning and pray we'd be attentive. And pray that each one of us would be changed to be more like the image of Christ. Lord, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take this time now to greet one another around us. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and please be seated. It's like a whole world to them, because 
for the first time they have received this precious gift. Operation Christmas Child gives our church an opportunity to touch the world. It's a great adventure to evangelize. You've got an army of volunteers that pack the boxes. They're helping OCC to take the gospel literally to millions of children. This is the Good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. Getting people locally to think globally. What I love about OCC is that they are intentional about pouring into the lives of kids. They receive a box and also an invitation to come back and learn more about Christ. We just don't want to just hand out a box and stop there. We want them to grow in their faith. It's a great tool, an effective tool to reach communities with the gospel of Jesus. It's exciting to get people to heaven, but it's also exciting to get heaven to people. So uh, there's these little shoe boxes out here. Uh, if you're like me and don't follow directions, it may take you longer uh, to build them than it should. But uh, no, that's better. Um, so there's boxes out in the lobby. Uh, this is for Operation Christmas Child. We did this last year. Uh, and we're able to pack, uh, pack up multiple different boxes uh, for children all across the world. And so uh, this is an opportunity for you as a family, maybe, uh, for you as a group of friends, um, uh, for you as a uh, married couple to be able to pack a shoebox or two uh, or maybe 10, whatever you felt led uh, to do, uh, to send out to these communities that are in need. Uh, these go out to different children uh, in multiple communities, and it's all about the gospel. And so they get to hear the gospel. Uh, they do a good news club uh, for the next week afterwards where uh, they do different training and teach them throughout uh, the Bible. And then they do uh, a little graduation service. And we'll see a little bit more of that maybe in a few weeks in a video. But uh, it's just a great opportunity to share God's word uh, and to, to share different gifts uh, with these kids that, uh, as I was talking to uh, someone this morning, we have so much. Uh, we have, uh, uh, they said, uh, a phone, an iPad, uh, uh, a tablet, uh, a laptop, uh, a desktop computer. Not do you just have one of those things. You have all of them, and we have so much here. Uh, this is an opportunity just to give a little bit to uh, some people that are struggling that don't have as much as we have. And so I hope and I pray that you all would take this opportunity uh, to reach out uh, and, and to give. And so what is the deadline on that, Sherry? November 18th. So you have a few weeks here on November 18th. Uh, we'll take all those and we'll send them out so they are out by Christmas time. Uh, so you have a few weeks to get involved with that. Uh, a couple other things. Tonight is our pulpit committee meeting. Uh, tonight after life groups and then Monday at 730 is our board meeting. Uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock is uh, Bible study for the adults, KYB and teen group. Uh, we want to say a special thanks to the August family. Thank you all so much for uh, having us to your home yesterday for a wonderful Wonderful day, uh, wonderful celebration there with the church family. PD started to clap, so we'll give you guys a clap. Thank you. Uh, it was a good time uh, for us that were able to come out, and so thank you again. Uh, senior Fellowship, Tuesday, October 30th at 1030. Uh, all the senior citizens of the church and friends, uh, you are invited to come in and enjoy a hymn sing and pumpkin decorating. Uh, delicious fall refreshments will be there. And so uh, please RSVP with Amber New Love if you'd like to take part in that. Uh, if you need transportation as well, uh, that can be provided. Just let her know. And that's all I have this morning. Let's have our ushers come forward. And as they're on their way, a couple of things I'd like to mention to you before we take the offering. Uh, someone gave me some statistics this morning, just blew me away. But since 1973, there have been about 60 million abortions in this country, about one out of every five citizen. And this is 10 times worse than what happened at the Holocaust, that all since 1973. 
And I'm saying that because we have been given as a church uh, a limited amount of pray to end abortion signs. You may have seen them around Hancock County. And uh, they're in my office. I ask uh, the Wednesday night prayer meeting crowd if they would please pray over those signs. And uh, they're available to you, one per family. But I'm asking instead of you just taking it and putting it in, in your yard and, and being insensitive, if you would please pray over it first. I want God to really use these uh, as they're placed around Hancock County. And I don't know if you're aware, but if you just look over at Washington, God is working in that area. I've been praying for years secretly that God would turn this thing around. And, I mean, in recent days, it's obvious his hand is working. So they're available. Also, as we have the offering this morning, we're going to see about a nine- or ten-minute uh, testimony of a gentleman whose life was absolutely transformed with a Gideon Bible. And so uh, that's going to be during the offering this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much that you are working in our world. And uh, as Pauline just sang, not only are you softly and tenderly calling people, but as we saw, man, uh, down in uh, the southeast this week and over on the coast of the Carolinas, it was a couple weeks ago, over in Indonesia, they're still finding bodies over there. We just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to wake up and pay attention to what's going on around us so that we could really be found ready when you come for us. We want to be found before you, spotless and blameless and holy. Pray now you come and bless this offering. Use it for your great and divine purposes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, y'all. I am uh, very nervous this morning, but this is, is such a wonderful opportunity to be able to be here. Uh, such a blessing to be able to be here in front of you today. Um, it's been a whirlwind past 48 hours after, like you said, just getting back from serving on, an, on mission in Puerto Rico for seven months. And uh, the reason that that is so crazy to me is that if you would have told me seven years ago that I'd be in Puerto Rico anywhere other than like on a beach, probably with an umbrella drink, or uh, if I'd be here in front of you today, like I probably would have questioned your sanity. Um, and the reason for that is that I didn't grow up in what many of you would call a Christian household. Um, before I was 20, I went to church probably a handful of times, and typically that was if I was with my grandmother in South Carolina, because I knew if I got dressed up in a suit and went to church with her, that she was going to bake me a sweet potato pie, right? And so in my mind, that was as good a reason as any to go to church. And so, um, but from the time that I was 15, I began living just a, a very crazy and, and sinful lifestyle. And I didn't have the kind of relationship with my parents that I would talk to them or tell them about the things that I was, that was going on with me or that I was doing. And all of my friends were all doing the same things, right? As Romans would put it, um, not only are they doing these things, but uh, if I can give a colloquial translation, uh, they're, 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 tell they're calling me the man for doing it, right? They're, they're get they do these things and they give approval to those who do them. And so in my mind, I was happy living that way. I didn't see any reason that I needed to change. And so you can join me kind of in my, my misunderstanding. I didn't understand it when, when I was 20, 2010. Um, suddenly there was all of this conviction. It's just seemingly out of nowhere, as if I was supposed to be living for something much greater than what I was, as if I was created to live for a purpose much greater than what I was. And, at the same time that I'm feeling this conviction, all around me there were all these little coincidences that seemed to be occurring, just of, of just little things that seemed to be pointing me in the direction of God. And um, not necessarily people uh, being willing to, to share the gospel with me, but just being willing to talk about God in my earshot, just little things. And it happened so frequently that eventually I was like, this can't be coincidence. Like, this, this can't be coincidence. And so I, I started calling it breadcrumbs, right? Like Hansel and Gretel, like the story. Um, as if perhaps God were leading me coincidence after coincidence, breadcrumb after breadcrumb along a path to discover who he was. I remember receiving a tract in my mail one time, and normally I wouldn't even give that a second look, right? And I'm like, I don't want that. Um, but this time, it, it was a, a track, and it said, uh, it was a survey on how you get to heaven. And it said that two-thirds of the people responded, you just got to be a good person. And I remember thinking to myself, like, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, and then you flip it over, and it's like, biblically, that's incorrect. And I was like, whoa. Um, and I remember being in an American literature class, and uh, we're, we're looking at Puritan literature. And so one week, we're reading about this loving, forgiving God, and then the next week, it's sinners in the hands of an angry God. And I remember the quote being that he stomps on his enemies like grapes in a wine press until their blood stains his robes. 
And I remember thinking to myself that, you know, my only religious experience were those couple times that I went to church when I was younger. And so if you would have asked me, I would have said, well, I guess I'm nothing else, so I must be a Christian. Um, and so I'm looking at this and I'm saying, Derek, you might say you're a Christian, but you have no idea which of these two representations of God are true. Or if they're both true, how is that possible? And I remember one day I'm walking on campus. I'm on the University of Alabama campus, Roll Tide. And, uh, and while I'm there, so at the time, my thought when I saw the Gideons is this. And again, you'll have to forgive me. This is before Christ, Derek, so forgive me. Um, and my thought when I see the Gideons is, okay, you can see them, that's fine. And they can see you, that's fine. But whatever you do, don't let them see you see them, right? Don't make eye contact, okay? Because otherwise they're going to want to talk to you and give you a Bible, all that. And I, I didn't want that, right? But on this day, we made eye contact. I knew I was trapped, and so I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. And, you know, and, so, and we talked for, for 20 or 30 minutes, and I told him about the conviction that I had been feeling. And I told him about the breadcrumbs that I was experiencing. And he said to me, yes, like, it sounds as if God is reaching out to you. And y'all, if he were standing in front of me today, I would not be able to point him out to you. And I think there's something beautiful in that. But I remember what he said to me next as if it were yesterday. He said, is the sin that you're living in, is it worth your eternal life? And I remember thinking to myself in that moment first, like, this is exactly why you don't talk to these guys, right? <laughs> but more than that, I remember thinking, I can't answer him, yes, it is worth my eternal life, because I might as well just say, yeah, that hell thing, I understand it, and I'm cool with going there. But I can't answer him, no, because that meant something had to change in my life, and I wasn't ready to give it up. And so I answered him, I don't know. And so he prayed with me, he gave me a Bible, and I went on my way. And as I looked in the Psalms, and I'm looking at this, this great biblical figure, David, and he's looking over all of creation, and he's saying, like, God, you who created all of this, who am I that you would take notice of me? And I'm thinking about myself, and y'all, I promise you, I'm no David, right? If I'm comparing myself here, I'm not even like a Philistine asleep in the back of the camp. Like, I'm nobody. And yet it seemed as if the God that created all of this was reaching out to me breadcrumb by breadcrumb on a path that I might discover who he was. And I remember later looking in Luke and the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, on what authority do you do these things? And he says, okay, I'll answer you that if you answer me this. John's baptism, was it from God or was it from man? And they say to themselves, well, we can't say it was from God because then they'll say, well, why didn't you believe it? But I'm not going to be the one in the middle of this crowd to say that it was from man. So they say, I don't know. And he says, neither will I answer you these things. And as I looked and compared myself in these stories, I realized how lost I was. As Ephesians 2 would put it, not only was I lost, I'm at enmity with God. That I was under the authority of the prince of the power of the air, that being Satan, as many of us once were. And not only that, I'm dead in my trespasses without hope. But y'all, praise God for verse 4, for Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who was rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive in Christ. Even while we were dead in our trespasses. Because if that was fall 2010 that I had that experience with the breadcrumbs and the Gideons, that January 9th, 2011, I remember it clearly because it was my 21st birthday. I woke up super early. It was a Sunday at some ungodly early hour, I think like 6 a.m., something like that. And uh, the prevailing thought on my mind was, I don't know what this is, but I've got to go to church. And I went and I stuck out like a sore thumb and the pastor told me, you know, Derek, there's a lot of places you could be on the morning of your 21st birthday other than in church for the first time. And we're so thankful to have you here. And y'all, 
I am so thankful that we serve and love a God who has continued to be faithful because he continued breadcrumb after breadcrumb until that fall 2011, I decided I don't just want to call myself a Christian and it have no bearing on my life. I want to know Christ and I want to follow him. And since that point, he has continued to leave me breadcrumb by breadcrumb. He used my undergrad at the University of Alabama to give me a love um, for Latinos as the least of these. And so since that time, I have served uh, on mission in Guatemala and in Costa Rica and now just returning after seven months of calling Puerto Rico my home. Um, he gave me a love for youth. Uh, he has led me now to Southeastern Seminary where I'm currently studying, hoping to finish out my MDiv in a year. And y'all, he is so faithful. He is so faithful in bringing people to be the breadcrumbs, speaking and giving his word in season and out of season. And I am so thankful to be able to be here in front of you sharing this today. Really fast before I leave, I just wanna say, my parents are actually in the audience today. It's their first time being able to hear me speak publicly. So y'all, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today and God bless you. as we sing through our worship songs. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. Of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose.
17 says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Not only does God see your brokenness, but he's got a plan to use it for his purpose and his glory. So today, choose to be real with him and give him your heart. Take all
Amen. Thank you. Let's turn, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3, if you have your Bibles. And I am so thankful that the Scriptures are so relevant, aren't you? Scriptures speak right to where we live. And this morning's topic is the topic of suffering. Anybody in here suffering this morning? Ever wonder what the Bible says about suffering? I felt bad one day and went over to see the doctor next door and since that time I've been doing some exercise in secret and part of my exercise routine I exercise six days a week part of my exercise routine is upper body I won't take off my jacket and shirt to demonstrate it but uh, just to maintain the muscles okay not to add to but uh, you know, I've got to tell you that uh, when I start lifting the, the weights upstairs here like this, uh, the older I get, I don't look forward to it. I don't look forward to working out every day. But you know what? Uh, long range, I, I do it because I want to be healthy and in shape and that sort of a thing. And I've got to tell you, when trial comes into my life, suffering comes into my life, I don't like it when someone uh, misunderstands me. I don't like it. The scriptures, as we read this morning, says people might slander you, which means speak falsely against you. The Greek word is to slander. I, I don't appreciate that. I don't like it at face value. But it's kind of like my 25-pound barbell system. I say, put that 5-pound weight right over here, would you please? And put that 10-pound weight right over here, would you please? And you know what Joseph said at the end of his days? This is Genesis 49, almost at the end of the book of Genesis. Maybe it's chapter 50. I think it's chapter 50. Joseph was able to say at the end of the day, look, you meant it to me for evil. Appreciate that very much. But God meant it for good. And that's what this whole paragraph, this next section is about. I don't, don't know if you remember it. I was in the... Uh, the uh, get-together last Saturday morning for the conference, and the speaker must have said it two or three times if he said it once. But he said, if you're going to be a part of a local church that's effective in your community, he said, you're going to have to have relevant biblical teaching and relevant biblical preaching. And I resonated with that because I want to be a part of a church that's on the cutting edge of things. And we're going to talk about a very relevant topic this morning. And in case you're not aware, there's been a lot of suffering going on in our world this week. I mean, my heart goes out a couple weeks ago. I asked a gentleman that prayed for us if he would please pray that morning for the situation over in Indonesia. And at the time, I got word there were 400 bodies that were found. By the time he got up here and spoke and prayed, there were like 800 bodies that were found. I'm, I'm finding out there are over 2,000 bodies that they're still finding over in Indonesia after that uh, tsunami came through there. And, of course, what was it? The Hurricane Florence parked itself over by the Carolinas and just kept churning and churning and churning. And, and uh, they're finding bodies over there. And what was it? Tuesday morning, it was forecasted to be a level one uh, hurricane coming up through the, pan the, the Gulf Coast. And uh, that's kind of like a big windstorm down in the south when you hear about a uh, category one. But by the time it made landfall, it was almost a category five. And you've probably seen the photographs. It was like a nuclear bomb exploded down there. There was the limousine crash in mid-state New York near where my parents are from. And so all that resonates with me. Twenty people in a stretch limousine blows a stop sign. And they pull 20, 18 bodies out of the vehicle. I mean, suffering, 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 suffering. What does the Bible have to say about our suffering? And I'm going to save for next week, Lord willing, verses 18 and following. That's really the heavy lifting part. I'm still working on those verses, so pray with me, would you? 
about those verses. I want God to speak to our hearts through those verses. There's something there for us. I'm confident of it. But I've really been focusing on that neck of the woods. But this first part, I really want to enjoy with you this morning. This is going to be Suffering 101. Why does God allow it in your life? Look at verse 13 with me again, this rhetorical question. Who can really harm you? Who can hurt you? Just put that five-pound weight right over there. It hurts. I appreciate. Thank you very much. I needed that criticism. That slander you just said against me, that really, really hurts. But put that right over there, that end of the barbell, and I'm going to allow God to just keep working, 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 using these things that are unpleasant in my life to accomplish his purposes. There was a missionary couple that went over into Pakistan years ago. They left everything here in the States, packed up and went to Pakistan of all places. And their six-month-old baby died. Their world was crushed and torn apart. But their testimony is that a wise man made his way to their house one day and looked them in the eye, this couple that went over there to serve the Lord. And this wise man in Pakistan told this couple that a tragedy like this is like being put in boiling water. If you're an egg, your affliction will make you hard-boiled and unresponsive. But if you're a potato, you will emerge soft and pliable, resilient and adaptable. And the lady went on to say, it may sound funny to God, but there have been times when I've prayed since that time, Lord, make me like the potato. Why does God allow suffering? Some individuals can be plunged into boiling water like this and they come out like a hard-boiled egg. Others... (laughs) guided by the Spirit of God, can be plunged into the same boiling water, and they come out like a soft, mashed potato. And I'm getting hungry when I'm speaking about this, aren't you? But which are you this morning? Why does God allow suffering in our lives? And again, this is a good place to stop because really Peter's shifting up in the high gear here, gear number three. He started out with salvation. That's the overall umbrella of this whole book of 1 Peter. He, Peter was the one that walked with the Lord. If anybody knows about salvation, it's Peter. That's how he starts this book, how great, how wonderful God is to give you this gift of salvation. Then he broke it down underneath the big umbrella. There are four areas of authority that you need to surrender your life to the Lord in if you're really one of his followers, the government, my employer. How about in my living room? How about down at the local church? How am I really using this great gift that God has given me? It'll show up if I submit to the Lord. Now, as I submit to the Lord, my gift back to the Lord is how I respond to him in these areas of my life. Even if submitting to the Lord in specific areas where God has planted me calls me to suffer. It's like, Lord, this is not very pleasant today, but you know what? i got to do it. got to maintain my spiritual health. So that's sort of a bird's eye view of where we're going to go this morning. I believe one of the key verses in this paragraph is in verse 15. If you look there with me, and a key word is the word sanctify. That word, when you get to the bottom of it, literally means to turn everything over to the Lord. He's good at it. And it reminded me, when I came to this neck of the woods, what was going on in Peter's day. In Peter's day, there was a man who was sitting on the throne of Rome whose name was Nero. Caesar Nero. This is not him. This is Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar started living about a hundred years before Christ ever came to this earth. And the Caesars were much like the pharaohs in the Old Testament. They really considered themselves to be godlike. And they didn't mind it if you stood up and said, Jesus is God. They would say, yes, he's one of many gods. Matter of fact, Caesar would say, I'm God. And by the time Nero came to the throne, when about this book was written that we're holding in our hands this morning, They had perfected the art that Caesar is God. And once a year, you had to audibly say, so it could be on record, 
that you believe that Caesar is Lord, the one over all the gods. And if you didn't say Caesar is Lord once a year, you were not given a certificate. That's when this book was written. And if you weren't given a certificate that you believe Caesar is Lord, they may not let you go into the local IGA and get food. Uh, you may not get the promotion if you had a job at all. I mean, this was big, a big deal back in the day. And so Peter comes along and he says, you want to know something? We believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, period. Let the chips fall where they may. Now, does that put things in perspective? Yeah, they came to Jesus and said, do you pay taxes? And Jesus told Peter, run down to the creek or run down to the sea and then throw your net in there and pull out a fish and reach into its mouth and whatever belongs to Caesar, give it to Caesar. <laughs> and whatever belongs to the Lord, give it to the Lord. A couple of occasions we have of that in the New Testament. But the point is, folks, you're going to suffer in our day and age also if you stand up and say that Jesus Christ is Lord, period. Let the chips fall where they may. Now, Having said that, it seems to make sense to me when I read the paragraph that way. Because when Jesus Christ has been given everything in my life, I've turned it all over to him. Watch what happens. Verse 13, right out of the gate. He says, turn it over to the Lord, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man. That, you know, that's verse 15. I said verse 13, so let's back up a minute. Rewind, push rewind. Verse 13, who is he that can literally afflict you if you're following, you're a fanatic of that which is good? That's, I'm just reading it out of the Greek translation there. He's telling us that if I'm really a follower of Jesus Christ, the first thing that ought to happen to me is that I can suffer for him confidently. I mean, I know this is going somewhere, right? This, this, this exercise that seems so difficult at the time. I'm thankful when I look long range at where all that's going. I don't appreciate it like when you slander me, when you say things about me that aren't pleasant. But you know what? It's part of the package. It's what I signed up to do is follow the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I am confident that there's nothing that you can do to me as a child of God that can harm me. Now, think about this for just a moment with me. Would you? Who's writing this? Peter. God's using Peter. Peter was told in the last chapter of John's gospel that he was going to be crucified. He knew where he was heading. Peter, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and run around wherever you wanted to go. But there's coming a day, Peter, when they're going to carry you. To your execution. He knew it. When I read the book of Acts, chapters 4 and 5, you know what they did to Peter? He's the one that healed the lame man at the temple, and silver and gold have I none. Have I none? Peter said that. But what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And he got up and walked and started praising the Lord, ran into the temple, got everybody's attention. They arrested Peter and John. They threw them into prison. They threatened them. Stop saying these things in Jesus' name. You know what they did? Went back out and started doing it all over again. Can't stop a guy like that. Went back to the church, and the church was all excited that these were people that were being persecuted for the name. So Peter has that in his past. As a matter of fact, in chapter 12, he's next in line to be executed. Peter was going to be executed the next morning. Acts chapter 12 tells us. James was already beheaded. Peter the next morning. But that night, the angel broke through, opened up the gates, the chains fell off and Peter was set free. This is the same one who's right. He understands there's nothing that can harm a child of God who's a fanatic for Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 12 verse 1, the same word was used over there. Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex, to harm, to hurt, to trouble the church of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says literally... A literal translation of this this morning. Who can harm you if you are a fanatic, a zealot of Jesus Christ? You ever been to a ball game? And there's certain ones at the ball games that are just sold out. I went down to the Buckeye Stadium one day. What's the name of that place called? The Horseshoe? I mean, even in our section, in the bleachers, there are some radical, radical, radical fans down there. Believe it or not, <laughs> they believe in the Buckeyes. Go Bucks. And the thing about a fanatical fan, you know they're sold out. Don't mess with him. <laughs> Don't mess with him. Peter is saying, who can harm you if you're sold out to Jesus Christ? It's a rhetorical question. It's just like adding weight 
on the end of a barbell. You may be trying to do it to hurt that fellow who sold out for Jesus Christ, but actually God means it for good. God can use it for his glory. So that's how he starts. I can confidently suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ when I've turned everything over to him. Look at the next verse. But if you do suffer for righteousness sake, the King James says happy. It's a Greek word that can be translated you're fortunate or you're blessed. I can suffer cheerfully, but would you notice it's got to be for the right reason. There are people who are suffering this morning who essentially got themselves into it. In fact, look over back at chapter 2, verse 20 of this uh, particular book. He's already dealt with this, so we don't need to develop it again. But back in chapter 2, verse 20, what glory, what prestige literally is it if when you're buffeted or struck with a fist for your faults, you take that patiently. But if when you do well, you suffer for it, you take that patiently. Now, this is what it is. Grace with God, literally. That's acceptable with the Lord. It's got to be for the right reason. It's got to be for righteousness' sake. So when you're being, quote, persecuted down at work, is it really for Christ's sake? Or is it maybe you're not giving 100%? The word was used in Matthew chapter 5 already. Jesus used it. We call this the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And he used the word there, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. That's all through the New Testament. So check yourself this morning. If you're suffering, is it really for the purposes to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ? And there's the right reaction. Blessed are you. <laughs> Literally happy are you. Machaira, fortunate are you. Praise God for it. If you're really suffering for... Again, check the record. That's what Peter and James did, and John did, rather, in Acts chapter 4 and 5 when they were incarcerated. That's what Paul and Silas did in Acts chapter 16 when they were in the Philippian jail, right? They just, they just praised the Lord. When Christ really reigns on the throne of my life, I've turned everything over to Him. Every crisis that comes into my life can be an opportunity for me to show the world that I'm a fanatic for Jesus Christ. I really believe this is working together for His good and for my glory. I mentioned this one a moment ago. But this is the one I went back to and read before the sun came up this morning. <laughs> because there's a word here that got my attention in the uh, context the Bible says when Peter, I'm sorry, Paul and Silas were placed in prison in the Philippian jail, at midnight they started singing praises to God and the prisoners heard them. Now if we were to go over there, we would find out that the guard responsible for Paul and Silas, the Bible says he heard them singing and he sprang in. That's the word that got my attention. He sprang in. I wonder what that word means. I checked that word out early this morning. It means, I mean, he lickety split. He ran to them to see what in the world was going on. There was an earthquake. They're singing praises to the Lord. There's an earthquake. And he knows that his life is on the line if these prisoners are set free. But he springs in and he finds them singing and praising God. He, he falls down and he says, sirs, what must I do to have what you've got? What must I do to be saved? He can use your circumstances when you do it for righteousness' sake and do it as unto the Lord for his glory. You've got to have the right reason, the right reaction. And notice at the end of the verse here, you've got to have the right resolve. He says, don't be afraid of their terror and don't be troubled. And I've, I've been thinking all week, what's the difference between the two? If you ask me, I think the one is what goes on on the inside and the other is what takes place on the outside. You've been threatened for Jesus' sake this week. If you've been misunderstood or, or what's the word over here in the original translation, if people are talking bad about you, um, slander, down in verse 16, when it says speak evil in the King James, literally when they slander you, you can just haul off and rejoice and thank the Lord for it. But on the outside, you don't have to have your knees knocking. And on the inside, you don't have to be scared away. God can take really good care of his people who turn everything over to him, again, which is the key. And I'm going to slow down and spend some time on this last point. Because to me, this all builds up to this. When I turn everything over to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a fanatical follower of him. I can suffer confidently. 
I can suffer cheerfully, but my suffering can be used for his ultimate purpose, which is to be used constructively for the glory of God. How does that work? Look down at verse 15. He says, when you're going through this sort of thing, sanctify, set apart the Lord as God of your hearts. Jesus Christ is not one of many gods. He is Lord of my life. That's what he's asking me to do. First of all, he's got to rule my heart. Now, I've said this before as we've been journeying through the book of 1 Peter, but 1 Peter is just filled with all kinds of Old Testament phrases and words. I mean, Peter must have loved reading the Old Testament. And whether you know it or not, this little phrase, turn everything over to the Lord or sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, is right out of the book of Isaiah chapter 8. As a matter of fact, could I ask you to just stick in your memory for just a moment this phrase, sanctify the Lord God and turn everything over to him. Because I want to show you back in the Old Testament how it was used and what I think Peter was thinking about when he gave it to us here in the New Testament. There was a king on the throne by the name of Ahaz. Ever heard of him? Maybe you've heard of Hezekiah. That's his father. Ahaz was Hezekiah's father. He was the 11th ruler in the uh, state of uh, Judah down in the south. And his name literally means Jehovah will sustain you. He will take care of you. What a name to be given by your mother, Ahaz. Every time she called his name, hey, Ahaz, I'm reminding you that the Lord will take good care of you. Turn everything over to him. Turn everything over to him. Turn everything. But you know what? He was a very wicked ruler. This is the sad truth of it. He was facing a major crisis. And how many of you remember Assyria was way out there in the northeast. Uh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. That's where God called Jonah to go and preach to the wicked Ninevites. Massive, massive, massive empire in the northeast. And they threatened to come down and bump off Judah. Well, just to the north of Judah was another land called Israel. And Israel and Syria got together and they said, hey, Ahaz, join our little band and together, the three of us, we'll knock off Assyria. Well, behind the scenes, this Ahaz started negotiating with the Assyrians, started breaking up pieces of the temple, the gold and the silver, and started sending pieces to the king up there to appease them. Isaiah the prophet who was on the scene at that time, who ministered to this Ahaz's uh, son, Hezekiah. Notice what it says here. Isaiah looks at Ahaz and he says, Sanctify, set the Lord of hosts apart all by himself. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. By the way, look up at verse 14 of uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice where it says, Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. comes right out of this Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. So the prophet at the time, his name was Isaiah, looks at Ahaz and says, look, let God take care of your problem. Turn everything over to him. But he doesn't listen. As a matter of fact, you talk about abortion. This Ahaz gave his own children to the false gods that the Israelites were worshiping at the time. And they burned them in the fire. All in an effort to appease the heathen gods. He's responsible, the, the, the Bible says in the King James translation, for 12,000 valiant men's deaths. All because he turned his back on the Lord. They had forsaken the Lord God of their father. They didn't turn everything over to the Lord as Peter is appealing for us to do in this passage this morning. And you can find time after time after time after time. We're studying the book of Jeremiah on Wednesday night. Jeremiah comes to the people, to the kings, and he asks him, turn it all over to the Lord. Turn it all over to the Lord. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And Peter is asking the folks in the New Testament who are facing persecution, trials, suffering, and sorrow, turn it all over to the Lord. While Ahaz went up to Damascus one day, that's the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. He started sacrificing to the gods of the Damascus. And it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, 
I'll sacrifice. Maybe they'll help me. But notice this is not the end of the verse. You know what the end of the verse is? Now you're at the end of 2 Chronicles 28. It says, but they were the ruin of him. Now that Ahaz, the king of Judah, right in the heart of all the kings, there's about 20 of them, he's the 11th one, he's right in the middle. He could have shown the world that when you turn everything over to the Lord, he's worth trusting. He takes good care of his own. But instead of doing that, he sacrificed to the heathen gods around him, and they were the ruin of him. Peter says, what are you going to do when you fall into a trial? What are you going to do when you're persecuted? What are you going to do when you suffer? He says the first thing in verse 15, Christ must rule your heart. But look at the end of verse 15. Christ must also rule your mind with his word. Be ready always. To give a defense. This is what a, a lawyer would do in a court of law. Stand up and speak on your behalf to defend you. He says, be ready always to give a, an apologia, literally a defense of the reason of the hope that's within you. See, that's what that guard did when Paul and Silas were in prison. What is it about you fanatics? What's gotten into you to be praising the Lord at midnight? We've just put you in. We've locked you down. That's what the word stocks means. Your hands and your feet. And they took rods and they would beat the back of them. But instead of cursing and swearing, what they may do it where you work. They were just praising the Lord. And the keeper, the guard said, what is going on around here? How can you do this? And they were able to give a reason of the hope which was in them and led that man to faith in Christ. And the Bible goes on to say that he and all of his household were saved, born again. This was an opportunity for them to show the world they really believe. Now notice what the text does not say here. We don't have to argue with him. Just like a trial lawyer doing his job, give them an answer and let the Holy Spirit take it from there. But notice these last two verses. When he's ruling in my heart, his word is controlling my mind. His ways then must control the way I rule my life. Do his ways rule your life, by the way? Paul would say in chapter 23, reminds me a lot when I looked over and saw Brett Kavanaugh going through what he went through a couple weeks ago on Capitol Hill. This would have been equivalent to what Paul faced when he walked into the Sanhedrin. Verse 1, he just looks at the whole crowd and says, I want you to know something. I have lived in all good conscience unto this day. The moment he met Christ as Savior and Lord God forgave him for all of his sin. You talk about being sold out to Jesus Christ and him alone. That was the Apostle Paul. And what do they do the Apostle Paul? They put him on a ship and they sent him over to Rome. And as far as we know, he was beheaded by the hand of Nero, this quote, God of the Romans back in the day. But he said he lived in all good conscience. Now, look what the Bible says about this, verse 15. Sanct or verse 16, have a good conscience that whereas they are slandering you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that are falsely accusing your good conversation in the Lord because it's better if God's will be accomplished that you suffer for well-doing than for evildoing. And I recall that uh, Paul and Peter and John and anyone who's ever gone down this road, they've just sold out to Jesus Christ, him alone. They were fanatics for Christ. They were used by God to bring many men and women to the throne of God's grace. As a matter of fact, there's another gentleman in the book of uh, Acts whose name is Stephen. He was a very godly man filled with the Holy Spirit. And one day he stood up to preach to this angry mob, the Sanhedrin. And over in Acts chapter 7, he started with their forefather, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then he started developing Joseph's life. He's walked through the Old Testament, and by the time he could get finished, the Bible says that while Stephen was preaching the gospel, he called him stiff-necked and uncertain. Remember the hard-boiled egg? When you drop that in water, what happens to it? The egg gets hard like a hard... Well, he says, you stiff-necked... You uncircumcised, you hard-hearted people. 
God would send you a messenger and you wouldn't listen. And God send you another messenger. You wouldn't listen. Finally, God sent his son and you crucified him on a... And they came unglued. You know what the Bible says? They begin to gnash on him with their teeth. I have a dentist who's a Christian, a wonderful Christian here in Hancock County. And we've talked about this subject on different occasions. I mean, what else do you do when he's probing in your mouth, right? So he talked about, he said to me one day, do you realize how often the Bible talks about people gnashing their teeth? I said, never really thought about it. Grinding their teeth. Look at the picture here. These men around uh, Stephen, they're being, he's being taken out to be stoned. They were gnashing on him. They were grinding their teeth. They're so hard on it. And back in the day when Stephen was stoned, they would push him off a ledge. And if he didn't die from falling off of that ledge, they picked up these huge boulders and they would finish off the job. But does anyone want to guess who was standing beside Stephen this day when he was being stoned to death? The Bible says they laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And he saw a fanatic for Jesus Christ. He saw someone who turned everything. He just let the chips fall where they may. And Stephen knew that no one can harm me as long as I'm right dead center in the will of God. That we've covered a lot of territory today. But why does God allow suffering in my life? I'd like us to make some application. Especially as we come to this sacred table called the communion table. Have you nailed this down yet that Jesus Christ is Lord? He's not one of many gods. That's polytheism. He's Lord of all. Have you settled that one? Because if you settle that one, then you can go on to answer these questions. Am I suffering confidently? Do I know God is going somewhere? Do I really believe Romans 8, 28? God really does work everything for his glory, for my good. Secondly, am I suffering cheerfully? Thank you very much. That hurts. You may see me smiling in public. I may be shedding tears secretly. It hurts. But I know at the end of the day, Genesis chapter 50, you mean it for evil, God means it for good. Do I suffer constructively? Do I let God take this suffering in my life as he rules in my heart, rules in my mind, and rules in my life? If you're not here yet this morning, if you never surrendered everything to Jesus, I'd like to ask you to do that right here in this service. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, and he does. He called me that way. But he does have the capability of turning up the volume if he needs to. And you can either do it the easy way, let him call you softly and tenderly, or you can let him call you the hard way. But either way, he wants you to come to him. Won't you come? I believe God's calling America. Someone said in one of my Bible studies, I go to quite a few Bible studies throughout the week, is it global warning, uh, warming or is it God's warning? That was a good question. Good question. What's God saying to America this morning? Are you listening? Are you responding? Are you letting him use your suffering for his glory? If you're a believer this morning and you'd like to come to the altar, it'd be a good time to do it right now as we bow our heads and uh, we're going to sing a chorus this morning instead of a hymn. I'd like to ask that we sing a chorus and get our hearts and our minds, our focus up where they need to be before we come to this communion table. But in this quiet moment, have you really surrendered everything over to the Lord? Is he really Lord of your life? I mean, if you stood before the authorities and they said to you, Either confess that Caesar is Lord or be denied your next meal. Which would you choose? Either confess that Caesar is Lord or you don't get the job promotion. Matter of fact, you don't even have a job. Don't bother coming back. What would you do? Would you still look up to heaven and say, Lord, I surrender all. I turn everything over to you. I'm trusting you from here on out. To do with me and through me as you will. Now, folks, that is mature Christianity. That's relevant Christianity right there. So if God's spoken to your heart, why don't you come during this invitation time. Lord, we love you. Please now speak to every heart. Help us to be obedient to your will, listening to your still small voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to stand together with me. And this is a song we don't usually sing for an invitation. But it's a chorus entitled, How Deep the Father's Love. It's really been ministering to me this week. And if God has spoken to your heart, why don't you come here in this invitation, okay? How deep the
the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulder Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me I know that it is finished. You may be seated. There's actually three parts to that, three stanzas, and we're going to sing the third one after our communion time together. But I'm going